kid. Seriously. Welcome to a spectacular webisode of your favorite Kid Seriously show. We're the only podcast around with three superheroes defending three different neighborhoods. Every now and again, we get together to discuss the world, play our world-famous trivia question game show, watch trailers, discuss other things from Nerdland that might tickle our fancy, and complain about the weather in the American Middle West. I am Maya Madrid, coming to you remotely from the dark recesses of the Wisconsin wilderness to the north and deep within the bowels of the camera studios, or as I call it, the friendly neighborhood, it's Luke Neitzel. And from the Pacific Northwest, it's the word slinger himself returning triumphantly from the MLS playoffs. It is Mark Neitzel. Gentlemen, how are you? We'll start with Luke. Oh, I'm, I'm good. I had a nice little, uh, nice little Arsenal game this morning that I got to watch, which was pretty enjoyable for two come from behind pounding of Tottenham. So that's always, always enjoyable. And it makes up for the rest of my sports weekend being kind of crappy, but that's all right. Cause I'm still living off the high. That was the, the, the double sided border battle last weekend where Minnesota took its rightful, rightful crown, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. I don't, I don't think I have too much else to report that's new with me or anything that's going on in, in my world other than it's, it's snowing. So we have to stay in separate houses cause Driving in snow is the worst, especially when it's one of the first driving in the snows and everyone forgets how to drive. It's true. Bad weather is sort of a theme on our show lately because we became the oldest podcast on the planet because it's a wintry mix out here and Lady Madrid has vetoed my driving. So speaking of weather, it's been a while, Mark, since you've been on the show. So we're dying to hear how was the MLS playoff games and what's going off in your life? Well, uh, first things last, so I am in day one of my three-day recovery from drinking until midnight last night, so I had a friend in town who came up from San Francisco, and uh, yeah, I had six drinks in six hours, and I am still in recovery from that, so I might be a little sluggish, I might be a little off my game, but the playoff game was up. pretty impressive uh, I actually think we'll get into it in a little more detail later but just to, to kind of tease it it was my first time standing in the Timbers army which was a bit of a, a scene unlike anything I've really done before so um, yeah my, more to come later on that particular topic but uh, it was it was quite an experience I, I do really I, love getting getting older because I, I had a similar experience yesterday where my partner and my kids were both gone at at separate events. So I had the house to myself and I was like, I'm going to enjoy myself. I bought myself uh, like 12 beers and I bought a bottle of wine and I was like, everything's stocked. And then I went and bought like a a little pizza from the pizza joint down the road that I like. And I ate half the pizza and had two beers. And then I fell asleep at 930. Mm -hmm. It was pretty impressive. Oh yeah. And I'm not even hung over. I'm just tired and sluggish and dehydrated. There's kids on your lawn. Yeah. It's, it, it's rough. It's rough. I, uh, I really should be in bed by nine thirty every night, but, uh, what about you, Maya? What's uh, going on now that you're in house arrest because you can't drive out in an inch of snow? Well, I'm not real happy about the Packers game. Obviously, we lost to the Cardinals today, which hurts enough. But we also fired Mike McCarthy after the game. Um, so it's – I don't think this is necessarily a good thing. I, I understand that we probably do need something a little less stale. But the fact of the matter is the guy coached for us for more than a decade. We've been good pretty much the entire time. And uh, you, it's not like there are a ton of great coaches out there that you can just – you know, I mean, you guys know better than anybody when you start going through these cycles of just coach after coach after coach. It's not a cycle you want to get into. So I'm not going to be real emotional about it. But, um, you know, Mike McCarthy was a guy I didn't wasn't really excited about when we first hired him. And uh, he's been, I think, in my opinion, one of the favorite coaches in any sport that that um, that I've had, a, you know, a team that I've cheered for. So this is kind of a bummer day for me. As an outsider who obviously does not like the Packers, I kind of feel that Mike McCarthy is bearing the brunt of Ted Thompson's years of failure. Yeah, I don't know about that. I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, draft picks that we picked this year uh, have not really panned out. 
And I think, you know, I mean, it's easy to, to sling arrows at Ted Thompson, but the fact of the matter is there hasn't been a GM who's been more successful than him in Packer history that's not named Vince Lombardi. So I think Ted Thompson was pretty good, and I think Mike McCarthy is pretty good, and I think most fan bases would, would take the success that each of those men have brought in our team. Be- better than Wolf? Oh, yeah, he's better than Wolf. Oh, because I, I would have thought that the uh... – I know we're getting sidetracked and we haven't even started or whatever, but I would have, I mean, the, if I remember correctly, the Favre Super Bowl team, weren't they like number one on offense, number one on special teams, and like number two on defense? And the Rogers Super Bowl team was kind of a, we got hot at the end. We were, I, I think they had to win like their last three games just to make the, the playoffs. So one, like, I guess one seemed like a real dominant force and one seemed like just everything clicked and they rolled. I think everything clicked and they rolled when they won the Super Bowl. But when you look at the long-term effect of the Packers and who was better for longer, I think it goes to Ted Thompson and Mike McCarthy. If you look, it was basically that season and the next season where they really hit it. They were very good in the three years before it, but they didn't have all those free agents. They hit those free agents and they were good for one year and it almost spilled into a second year. But then the wheels came off pretty quick after that. And when you go back and look, it's like 1992 to 1998. This is almost twice as long, twice as twice as much success uh, from the, the, the current or you know the recent uh, GM and head coach as those before it. So I'll, I'll take Mike McCarthy and I'll take uh, Ted Thompson, as crazy as that sounds. I'll take Aaron Rodgers over Brett Favre. Oh, well, I, I, I 100% could see taking Aaron Rodgers over Brett Favre. But I, man, I, it just seems like for as good a quarterback as Aaron Rodgers has, they they just haven't done a great job of building around him. Like they just seem like a team that should, you know, if they only go to one Super Bowl with with him, it kind of seems like a, a failure. And maybe I'm overestimating mating him and some of the other good teams that have been in the NFC in that period of time. But you know, as a team that basically has had shitty quarterbacks for my entire fandom. To, to think of having someone like Aaron Rodgers and only making one Super Bowl seems like it it's a bit of a letdown. Now, granted, a Super Bowl is amazing, so I'm not trying to discount that. But And also, too, how much of their success is simply Aaron Rodgers humping their sorry asses across the finish line? Uh, I mean, he seems to be able to make up for a lot of shortcomings, as a, as a great quarterback should. It's That, how it always seemed to me, was that if you you know take out Aaron Rodgers and suddenly they're not much better than you know the Cleveland Browns. I mean, look what happened when he got injured last year. And as soon as you take him out, then they're just abject terrible. So, I, I mean, that was last year. I mean, I go back and look like uh, Matt Flynn and, and times when backup quarterbacks have come in before they've been extremely successful and extremely productive. So, I mean. We kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a what have you done for me lately league by definition, um, but that is not the story overall of the team. And when you go back and look at that Super Bowl team and look at the quality of players on both sides of the football between B.J. Raji and Clay Matthews and Charles Woodson and Tremont Williams in his prime and then the offensive line, which a lot of no-name guys, but we had Dietrich Smith and, and stuff like that, uh, you know, like they were a lot more talented than people are thinking. Are they not? Are they talented now? Absolutely not. It's going to be a real tough slog. And that's the good news is that you can get good real quick in the NFL. But um, you know, it's 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 an argument of convenience that they're bad right now. So it's kind of piling on. We get a little. I don't want to use the term revisionist history because everybody uses revisionist history incorrectly of that term. Um, but I think it's it's a little patronizing. Uh, yeah, they're bad now, and they're bad the last two years, and that's why Ted Thompson's gone, and that's why there's a new GM. But at the end of the day, it's not Mike McCarthy's fault that none of the guys can catch a goddamn football. Sure. Well, and you can also say too, I mean that you know they don't the Seahawks don't have a miracle last two minutes or whatever, and then he is in more Super Bowl. You know, st- stuff happens. So. Well, let's get to uh, Paul Molitor's mistress's favorite game show. It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong in true American style. Our contestants are going to offer up earnest opinions, which will either be taken as fact or immediately mocked by our moderator. Here's how the two-player version of our game works. There's seven questions, and I believe it's Mark and I going against each other tonight. So that means Luke would administer. The winner is the one who gets four. The order comes in a serpentine style. I think it's Luke. Luke, I turn it over to you. 
That is correct. And uh, Maya, you, uh, having played most recently, get to go first in the the top spot. So I'm going to ask seven questions here that I wrote. We're going to start with question one. You will get to answer first, and then Mark will get the even numbers to go first. So, boys, Mark, are you ready? Yeah, go for it. Maya, you ready? I'm ready. All right, question one. Now, I had a nice little date night earlier this week. It was a, a pleasant little Thursday when I got to take out my, my hot piece of side action, Maya, with me to uh, a stand-up show. We went and saw local Milwaukee legend and hero Gareth Reynolds, uh, famous for doing the being half of the Dollop podcast. He did a live show here at a just a little neighborhood bar while he was in town for Thanksgiving visiting his family. And it led us both to kind of lament the fact that we haven't gone to more stand-up shows in our lives, even though as we sat and thought about it over the last few days, we've come up each with more stand-up shows than we realized we've been to. Um, and Mark, you used to work in a comedy club, so you, you're a little more active in this this world than we are. But my question for both of you is, who is the one stand-up comic, living or dead, that you wish you could see or could have seen? And we start with Maya. I think Richard Pryor is probably the greatest. I'm, I'm tempted to go Anthony Jeselnik here because I think he's the greatest living uh, comedian, but the greatest comedian of all time is Richard Pryor, and that's who I'd want to see. He was biting. He was hilarious. Uh, he had that that great feel of just, like, real crazy, like would do crazy shit, and so um, just kind of had his personal life in disarray, which always makes it better. Um, so I, I'm going to go Richard Pryor here. Um, so... I absolutely agree with you that Richard Pryor is the greatest stand-up comic of all time. However, I don't think that is the right answer because Pryor's skills in his material easily translates into a video form. So you can watch uh, a video of his stand-up from back in the day and you can get the full effect. And I think you can really appreciate what he's doing. My answer is going to be Andy Kaufman. And the reason is... Because in a whole lot of his routines, what he is doing is not what's important. It's the reaction of the people in the audience who aren't in on the joke. So, for example, he had one famous routine where he got up on stage and he just started reading from The Great Gatsby. And that's all it was. And gradually people would start getting uncomfortable or they'd start making comments. And then he would react to them and then go back to reading it and the real pleasure for the people who got the joke was in watching everybody in the crowd get pissed at him for not doing what they thought was an acceptable stand-up routine. So I think that that's more of an experience you had to be there to fully appreciate and that you don't get that same effect um, watching it on tape years later. So I'm going Andy Kaufman. Well, guys, th this is interesting. We have uh, three people in this, this little podcast and we have three different answers and they're all very, very good answers. So the technical correct answer written on paper is George Carlin, who's my favorite stand-up comedian of all time. Um, so, so that's who I really wish. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to give the point here on this one to Maya. And, and the reason I'm going to give the point to Maya is while I appreciate everything Mark's saying, I think that the... The cool factor of what you're talking about with Andy Kaufman isn't in going and enjoying the actual performance. It's in telling people afterwards that you were at this really weird, unique type thing. Whereas going to see Richard Pryor is also pretty awesome and a pretty cool thing to tell people about and brag about. But the actual experience is going to be a lot more enjoyable while you're physically there than watching um, Andy Kaufman set up a sleeping bag and lie down for an hour after I just paid a bunch of money to get in there, which he did once. So more, more credit to him. They're both great answers, but I, I'm going to go Maya because I think that's going to be the more enjoyable time overall. So... We are on to question two, and this is going to be some sad news. It comes from the world of TV. It's especially sad for Maya, as Netflix has announced they canceled Daredevil after what was a critically acclaimed, and it sounds like, but we don't really know, decently viewed third season, but Netflix doesn't release its numbers, so it's kind of vague. Now, this isn't surprising. They've already canceled The Defenders. They canceled Iron Fist and Luke Cage. And I think it's pretty safe to assume that once these new seasons of Jessica Jones and The Punisher 
are canceled or are aired, they will abruptly be canceled. And while there's been some teasers from Marvel about maybe bringing these back, it sounds really, really vague. And it doesn't sound like it would be Charlie Cox coming back as Daredevil. It's just we might do something with this character down the road. Uh, so that's that's disappointing. And, and having a show you really like being uh, canceled is always disappointing. So taking these Marvel ones out... What is the TV show cancellation that hits you the hardest? Mark, we start with you. Oh, this is easy. Arrested Development. Uh, clear in a way. Um, in fact, that was... I've, I've actually been pretty lucky in my television viewing history in that I have never truly fallen in love with shows that got the rug pulled out from under them. I was always able to watch the shows until they were able to go to their completion. So Arrested Development was the first show that I ever was really following and got canceled. And I think, um, you know, the two Netflix seasons are a completely different entity. And so we're not even talking about those in the same conversation. Um, But that was a show that was brilliant in every respect, just light years ahead of anything else that was on TV at the time. And was canceled well before its prime. Maya? Uh, for me, and this is going to be a terrible answer, because the, the this watershed moment for me was when David Duchovny left X-Files and the show kept going on, so it would have been better <laughs> had it been canceled at that point. So I never really had this moment. The real one that I was sort of forlorn about, and this is this is going to get me flamed, but you know what? It's the truth is Smallville. Smallville, I wanted more of Tom Welling and um, oh, her name, her name escapes me at the moment, but the, the lowest uh, casting in that show was absolutely phenomenal. And that is the one that I wish that we could have had more of. And then honestly, I, I can't answer with this, but the daredevil one just recently is the hardest hit, but I, I got something a little different. I thought it was pretty clear from what I read that they were going to bring it over. Luke, did you read something different? I, like, I read, the, well, the Mar- the Marvel statement is, all the Marvel statement is is that you haven't seen the last of the man with no fear. And then there's some quotes from some producers saying that the, the Marvel, the people who are show running and producing the Marvel shows for Disney Plus are different than the producers who are doing the Marvel Netflix shows, and those are not people that get along. So... Yeah, probably. So, so it sounds like they, you know, but maybe in a plus side, maybe this opens up the door to a, a new daredevil on the big screen, uh, you know, and, and I know everyone loves Charlie Cox. I thought Charlie Cox was great too, but um, there's a lot of people who liked Andrew Garfield and I don't think anyone's upset about Tom Holland. So maybe this could be a same type scenario, but w- what I took from that was it, what they said was so vague um, and then reading some of these other kind of rumors, and it's all rumors at this stage. It led me to believe that they're done with these characters. And let's be honest too. Probably, it's good. No, go ahead. I was just going to say it's probably just wishful thinking on my part because Daredevil is my guy, and they got so much right in this series. Um, they did, they did it exactly right, and so I'm kind of kind of holding on to hope. And season three was by far the best season, and it had so many more highs. It was show that had a ton of great highs and so um i am pretty depressed if if they make major changes but i would obviously love a daredevil movie and i was also just going to say too that you know even if they do plan on doing it later all of these actors are going to go on and do other things so by the time they get around to putting it together again they're going to have to recast because half of these people will be off doing you know hawaii Five O remakes on cbs Maybe, but I think that the I think the people at Disney are very concerned about having enough new quality program. We know that from Loki and Scarlet Witch, where they are been very very quick to get things going. And so my hope, and again, this is probably me just hoping against hope, but yeah, that they might have they might have plans to 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 do something like this. They've known for a long time that Netflix and Disney were going to be in competition, so it would not surprise me. Fingers crossed that maybe. Just maybe, maybe, maybe they could pull this off. Well, yeah, and, and that's fabulous, but it has nothing to do with um, neither of you getting the actual correct answer on no. this, which for, for me is, is Friday Night Lights. And I, I loved Arrested Development as well. I never have seen Smallville. But uh, the reason I put Friday Night Lights more is because Arrested Development is a show that when you, you showed me the concept, you showed me the cast, I was like, yeah, I'm going to love that from the get-go Friday night lights is not something I looked at and went, Oh, I would, I would love this show. And I 
freaking love that show. It's insane how good it is. And I've never seen a show that rotated its cast so well without it feeling like it skipped a beat. And even though that show did really, I love the way it ended up wrapping up, it's still sad we couldn't have got more of it because it was great TV. From a points perspective, I guess I just really have to give it to Mark because I've never seen Smallville. <laughs> so um, it's not a bad answer. I just haven't seen it. So we will throw you that don't point. Really like, you don't really like Superman, Luke, so you're not missing much. I like him a lot more now. I didn't like him previously. I, I didn't like him at the time that that show was out, which is probably part of the reason I didn't watch it. But I, I actually really like him as a character now. And I really like him for a lot of the reasons you told me I should like him back in the day right. that I was very dismissive of. So, Well, Luke, when I return your DVDs at some point in the <laughs> next couple of years, I will uh, I'll include season one so you can get your CW on. Which is great because then I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in a box and not watch it and never give it back to you. There you yeah, go. We're all we're all shitting over the fact that I just scored that point. All right, so it's one one. Let's go one one. Question three: MLS Cup is set for next Saturday, and we know how excited Mark is since his uh, lifelong favorite team, the Portland Timbers, have clinched it, and they are in an upward battle, uphill battle against a heavily favored Atlanta United team, who's who's you know the league really didn't exist until they came in, despite what Seattle will tell you. Now, assuming Atlanta wins, there will be 11 teams entering next season of MLS who have never won MLS Cup. Which of the teams, which I will list for you, and Maya, you're going to go first here, is the most deserving of a title? So, the 11 teams in no particular order. Minnesota United, Cincinnati German football team, or whatever they name themselves, NYC FC, Red Bull New York, Orlando City, LAFC, Montreal Impact, New England Revolution, Philadelphia Union, Vancouver Whitecaps. Well, um, I really want to go Red Bull New York here because I think that is the answer that would give me the point. But I'm going to go New England Revolution. I was at MLS Cup when one of the years where they had the the heartbreak. I saw Taylor Twelman's uh, glorious tears on the pitch. They've been... You know, a solid team. And obviously, they're up and down, but I think over the course of the history of MLS, they're one of those old school uh, teams. You know, the original teams that came through, and um, I think they really deserve it. So I'm going to go. Even though I know that the answer is Red Bull New York here, I'm going to go uh, New England Revolution. Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, Red Bull New York because of all of the reasons that Maya said. Except they actually are good and win games and win supporter shields. So. They produce. They're owed. They should be the next ones to win. Well, everyone, signal the Stanley Tucci alarm. The written down answer was the New England Revolution. The the team I despise more than any other team in MLS. But we're uh, we're forgetting a little bit of our history. This is the team that has lost five MLS Cups. And in heartbreaking fashion in a lot of instances, especially, I believe it was the first one against the Houston Dynamo where Taylor Twellman, the world's biggest knob of an announcer, <laughs> scored in extra time only to have Brian Ching immediately score on the next kickoff and then lose in a shootout. I, I had the the Red Bull, I, was, I had three contenders on this when I made this list. It was it was Red Bull, Dallas, and New England because they're all, they're all original franchises. They all have done some things really well. Now, England, New England's been bad the last few years, but they were in MLS Cup four years ago against uh, LA. So it's not like they have. it's been a while for them. Uh, again, they've lost five. All three of these teams draw like shit, which is too bad because I wanted to hold that against New England, but you can't elevate Dallas and you can't elevate the Red Bulls by saying that New England's attendance is bad because that's just not fair. Uh, N- New England... New England owned this league for the first, you know, the first, you know, decade or so and just could not get across the finish line uh, where the Red Bulls were a complete garbage until the last few years where they've been really good. And Maybe when Mark started watching, that's why. He's... Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and the same with Dallas. Dallas. Dallas was just utter garbage for forever, even though their academy is a model. Um, they're the, the first round burnouts. Every single year. So the answer written down on paper, the New England Revolution, you're Wait, the most deserving I, and you're I, my least favorite team. I need to make a comment here. I am upset that you think the people of Boston are owed another title winning team. All right. If any group of fans on earth deserve to not win another title, 
it's freaking Boston fan. So yeah. You go with New York. Yeah, the long suffering New York fan market. <laughs> and we're not giving it to Dallas because, you know, it's in Texas. So the answer is New England. We're moving on to question four. Maya, two to one right now. Question four. It is December 2nd, which means we are in full blown Christmas time. And for me and my family, that means a lot of uh, typical holiday traditions, like we set up the tree. My partner and the kids made cookies today. We need to start wrapping presents. And in the case of my partner in particular, watching way too many fucking Hallmark Christmas movies. I knew way too fucking much about what's going on with Candace Cameron Bure these days than I ever wanted to know. So, setting aside Candace Cameron Bure movies, because if you pick one, I'm going to immediately disqualify you from the whole fucking game. And we're also not counting Die Hard, because that's way too easy. What is your go-to Christmas movie? Mark, we start with you. Oh, well, it, it may be too obvious, but um, I was on the train before, uh, I think it's TBS, did the 24-hour marathon. It's a Christmas story. Um, it's a great movie. It's One of the joys of it, too, is that it's episodic. So you can put it on, you can be putzing around the house and you can come back into it and basically watch a segment and enjoy it in full and then dip out again. So it's really great for movie for having kind of in the background while you're doing all of the things that you're doing on Christmas Day. Um, it's hilarious. It's all about Christmas, so Christmas story. And it has the leg lamp which is one of the most enduring cultural icons of uh, Christmas in America. Maya? That's a great answer and would have been my answer had I gone first. I got bit by uh, the serpentine style. But here's what I'm going to say. Shot in the dark, Home Alone is the, the overall entertainment factor of Home Alone. Is, it's, it still stands up. It's hilarious. It's great to watch with the kids. And by the way, this time of year also, in addition to watching Hallmark, in addition to what you're making cookies, it is also Luke Neitzel's birthday tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. So I just want to wish you a very happy oh, birthday. Lord. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a perfect way to start off the season. My video is down, so you can't see the face I'm making right now. But let me tell you, if you could see it, you would be horrified at how I'm looking at you. You know, for two for two guys who normally do pretty well, at least one of you getting my answers, we're kind of we're kind of striking out this time. Uh, the correct answer is, of course, the 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 Dennis Leary starring the ref from like nineteen ninety three, oh. Ted Ted Demi. That is by far the best Christmas movie ever made, even even if it does star Kevin Spacey in a supporting role. But he plays kind of a creepy asshole in that, so it kind of works out for him, I guess, in real life as well. But uh, that movie is fantastic, even if it's really just kind of an excuse to let Dennis Leary do stand-up for, you know, a little bit. But as we proved earlier, we all like stand-up now. It so, also features an unknown J.K. Simmons. It does, as the military academy leader. Oh, man, yeah. there are so, yeah, oh, I nailed your wife, Bob, three times. She said you never went three times, Bob. Oh, that is a that is an outstanding outstanding movie. I'm gonna give the point on this one uh, to Mark because I hate Home Alone, absolutely hate it, and it comes back to my childhood because that movie was insanely insanely popular, and I was like the last kid to saw it, and my horror struck realization that the movie wasn't an hour and a half of them in the murder house at the end was devastating, and I never recovered from that because I don't I don't give a a shit about you know, old men salt in the sidewalk or whatever else was going on for that long. So I'm going to give it to uh, a Christmas story, even if it is now not going to have 24 hour marathons because it features bullying. So <laughs> um, is that true? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I saw it on Twitter. So it's as true as Twitter <laughs> is apparently. So our good friend, Mr. Smithers uh, tweeted that out. So we are all tied moving in. And that totally didn't play a part in my decision making either liking tie games. Anyways, we're heading into question five. It's an odd-numbered question, which means it's going to go to Maya, and we are going to switch into actual comic book news. Not comic book movies. Comic book news. Where the best comic book character of all time, my childhood favorite, Wolverine, recently has returned from the dead in all his glory. But ladies and gentlemen, he is not the same old Wooly. Because now, he has hot claws! Mm -hmm. That is right. He can heat his claws up to white hot intensity as he slices through things. I'm not entirely sure how that's more useful than having unbreakable razor sharp claws, but apparently he, he has that now. So most times, like this, 
when comics try to reinvent a character and add new superpowers, it ends up being a bit of a joke and leads to a pretty quick course correction. But there are some instances where remaking a character has been perfectly done and improved that character. So, gentlemen, give me your character who was a redone, had a power added, a costume change, maybe a different incarnation, and it vastly improved the character. We start with Maya. Oh, gosh, because I thought this question was going to go the other way, which named name the, the most awesome, terrible redesign, and that was that Superman when they had, like, the electric <laughs> Superman. Where it was oh, my God. Like, you know what? I actually Superman didn't read my... I didn't read my copy exactly as I wrote it because I actually had a line in there that was like, looking at you, Electric Superman. <laughs> oh, it was so good. It's so good. Um, and this is a character that I don't particularly care about, but uh, and we've talked about this. In fact, we had an entire episode devoted to this uh, last mm-hmm. week, and that's Aquaman. When Aquaman went from the, you know, the clean-cut, blonde hair, blue eye, every, you know, the, the, the fish next door to like the sort of grizzled uh you know dude with the beard and like the hook for the arm uh, that was the best one that stuck around and my favorite it took a character who um was basically a giant douche and it made him at least palatable and a character that i enjoyed and it also gave him uh it was also like an attitude change for the character too where he went from um just kind of being you know i mean they had a problem where it was like clark kent bruce wayne Hal Jordan, uh, Barry Allen, and Arthur Curry were all the same guy. And he became basically uh, just like a prick. And uh, it was something interesting. It was something that that team, the Justice League of America, needed at the time in comics. So I'm going to go Aquaman's redesign with the hook and the facial hair. Captain Hook is what works for Maya. Okay. Um, I'm actually a little surprised you went with that and not the obvious correct answer, which is... It wasn't really a cosmetic change or even change of power, but it was a complete sort of reimagining of the character and his world. And that was Frank Miller redoing Daredevil, turning him from a, yeah, don't wave your hand at me, all right? Yes. It's basically changing him from a, you know, a, a circus Daredevil acrobat into, you know, this ninja who's, you know, noir and dealing with, and basically sort of, he became Marvel's version of Batman. Um, I think that that was a really successful reimagining of a character that goes beyond simply, you know, cutting his hand off or giving him a beard, but really taking the character in new directions. Um, so I'm going with uh, Frank Miller and Daredevil. I feel like with the emphatic hand waving, I need to allow a rebuttal. Oh, Lord. This is just, first of all, it's asinine because he went through a pretty big redesign right before Frank Miller started doing it. So it wasn't like Frank Miller gets a ton of credit for something that wasn't not, not entirely his doing. Also, in Mark's statement, he talked about basically became Marvel's Batman. But as you and I have talked about, Daredevil's reimagining, if that's what we're calling it, was before DC's Batman's reimagining. And that's something that also pisses me off. So that answer- All right, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in at this point and tell you that. Do you guys even know me? Uh, you, you picked Daredevil and Aquaman. I'm a little, I don't know. I don't know your crowd, guys. The, the obvious answer is the, uh, the ditching of, what is it, Alan Scott? Green Lantern and bringing in the Hal Jordan Green Lantern. So like, the original Green Lantern was like a dude in a red suit with like a lantern who did magic tricks. Um, and they ditched that and they brought in the actual Green Lantern core, the Ring of Power, all those type of things. Wait, that, wait, there's two Green Lanterns? Oh my gosh. Don't even, don't even, if, if I would have disqualified you actually, if you, if you had, if you had tried to, to give me the Kyle Rayner turns into like, a self-powering Green Lantern, because that's an unacceptable answer. Um, but no, getting rid of Alan Scott and bringing in uh, Hal Jordan and redoing it and making it the Green Lantern Corps is the the greatest ever. And the point here, I guess, is going to have to go to Mark on this one. Two reasons. First, oh. first, the main arguments that Mai gave was beard and hook hand, which I don't think I can support. And the other, the other issues on Daredevil is I, I wasn't asking you which artist redefined a character best. I don't give a shit if it was Frank Miller or whoever. Someone changed Daredevil into something a lot cooler than he was. Uh, and whoever gets credit, I, I don't care. Five episodes. Yeah, but... Five, five, but, like, oh God. But, but you picked a guy and your rationale was he got a hook for a hand, and I cannot support no, that. That's not my rationale. The entire redesign of Aquaman was... <laughs> your, your closing statement was they gave him a hook and a beard. So on those grounds, 
I am. We're, we'll play the rest under protest. I find that fair, but one guy's Aquaman and he has a hook for a, a hand. Ooh. And I will be there on the 21st in all its glory to watch Jason Momoa go, whoa, dude. So anyway, Mark now takes a lead as we move into question six. So this is do or die time here, but I feel like this is going to be way more. This this question leans Maya. So um, come hard here, Maya, because I think you can do this. Now, I am not a fan of network TV, and I have not been for a very long time. But the one show I do like on network TV, even though I've fallen a little behind this year, is uh, The Good Place. Which, if you haven't watched anything of Michael Schur's, he is a, a genius. He's the guy behind Parks and Recreation. And one of the standouts of that show is bumbling robber and proud Jacksonville resident Jason, played by uh, Manny Jacinto. And the running joke has been his love of Blake Bortles and the Jacksonville Jaguars. In the wake of the successful playoff run they had last year and their 3 and one starts, there was an episode of The Good Place where a demon declared that the world was completely out of whack and the Jacksonville Jaguars were legit good now. Well, since that episode aired, the Jaguars have not won a single game and Bortles has been placed on the bench. This is leading many to believe that there is a Good Place curse that has been placed upon the Jacksonville Jaguars. Gentlemen, what is your all-time favorite sports curse? And this is even, so we start with Mark. Ooh, all-time favorite sports curse. Um, oh, I mean, there's the obvious one of the the curse of the Bambino, which um, inflicted years of misery upon the Boston Red Sox uh, and their fans. But I'm not going to pick that one. Because I have spent the majority of my life so sick of listening to Boston fans piss and moan over the fact that they never won an award or a title that they assumed they should God should just hand them on a silver platter. So I'm going to go with um, what's uh, ridiculous, but is kind of folksy and is still um, charming at the same time. And that was the uh, Curse of the Goat on the Cubs, where they... Uh, Allegedly, they wouldn't let the fan bring his goat into the stadium, and he cursed the Cubs, and they went on to not win forever and be a lot more self-effacing and a lot less obnoxious about the fact that they never won a World Series than the Boston Red Sox. I'm going to go with uh, the curse that's still happening, and that's the Chief Wahoo curse to the Cleveland Indians for having the most racist uh, team not named the Washington Redskins. And that curse is actually still going. So I'm going to go Chief Wahoo, Cleveland Indians. Well, you, you guys missed it, uh, which I'm not surprised because this is a weird topic. And I I, uh, I went with the Madden curse, that the, the player who oh. ends up on the cover of the Madden NFL game will have a, a terrible season, which went in uh, along with Sean Alexander, Dante Culpepper. A lot of guys have, uh, have undergone that curse. That's actually my favorite because I think it's kind of good-natured and fun. But uh, yeah, gotta go, gotta go, point Maya, because fuck you, Cleveland. Even though you, you at least you retired that thing after way too long a period. But you know, you you still got that name. You know, just j- become the Cleveland Americans, and uh, you know, just go with go with your C and continue to be shitty. So, uh, we, gentlemen, we are tied. We are tied going into question seven. I I I never would have imagined that, even though somehow that always happens when I'm in charge. Weird, huh? But anyways, we're gonna go into question seven, and uh. I got to tell you, there's a little bit of hurt and anger uh, for me in this question. And that means we're going to talk about the things that are important to me because, you know, we talk trailers and every week we get together and we discuss certain trailers and, you know, we try to find things that are awesome and important to us and whatnot. Well, there was a trailer for season two of The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, but we're not going to fucking talk about it this week, apparently, which has got me a little devastated. So I'm going to force us to talk about The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina in our last question here. Now, I obviously adore this show. It's been a hit with critics. It's been a hit with viewers. It's one of Netflix's uh, highest rated shows, as far as they tell us. A Christmas special is only a few weeks away, and I'm relatively giddy for it. But it hasn't all been roses for the show. It's had some problems. Netflix and the show were recently sued for $50 million for copyright infringement by the Satanic Temple. Now, the Temple claims that the creator stole the design for their trademark statue trademarked statue of Baphomet and children, which is a giant goat man giving kind of a almost shocker esque. He's just missing a finger and he's given the shocker with two little kids praying to him. And uh, the, basically the exact same statue is featured in the school for witches in Sabrina that uh, she attends. 
So, uh, but the, the temple, they settled this lawsuit actually now and they get credit for it and everything seems to be fine. But they aren't just upset about copyright. Now, spokesman and founder, Lucian Greaves, which cannot be his real name because no one has actually named that in real life. But apparently he's going by Lucian Greaves. He's upset about the depiction of Satanists saying, quote, would they be as understanding of a fictional show that used a real mosque as the HQ for a terrorist cell? Or a fictional, you know, you know, blood, whatever, in implicating real world Jews. So he's upset that they're misinterpreting what is actually happening with modern day Satanism. Which I can see how that can be upsetting. So we're going to veer slightly, but I want you to think of a movie or TV moment that made you feel, that you feel is misunderstood by most viewers who watch it. And it upsets you that most people don't seem to understand what it was actually intending to say. So, I know this is kind of a deep philosophical question. You got to have some time to think about it because, you know, you, you don't want to take a question that I'm I'm giving you the, uh, that I'm in charge of that's about the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. You don't want to take that lightly, gentlemen. You need to take it seriously. So, we are going to start it off now with you, Maya Madrid. What is your moment? Well, first of all, I just want to say I looked into that a little bit because I know how much you like that show. And I'm actually considering watching that when my dad comes for Christmas. We always binge something and we can't binge Stranger Things because it's not coming out until summer. And so it's kind of that that same sort of feel to it. So I was excited. I looked into the Satanist uh, lawsuit a little bit and I was looking at some of the pictures. They straight up stole it. Oh, yeah. It's 100% stolen. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. But um, for me, the, the... the show was The Sopranos. A lot of people didn't like the finale to The Sopranos, and I thought it was one of the greatest pieces of art that I couldn't see, or could have ever, or have ever seen. Uh, people in the lead up to that were wondering, like, how do you finish a show like this? What are you going to do? What's that? And the entirety of the show is about not being able to end it. Like, you look, and every song that they have, um, you know, like it's any way you want it. That's the way you need it. And they have like people you know, struggling the entire episode of putting things into park and then it just doesn't end. And what they were saying was, is like, we don't know how to end this. We don't really want to end this. So it just is. And I thought it was the most beautiful episode of television that I've seen ever. And I I don't think a lot of people got it. And, um, and I think that was unfortunate because I think it was brilliant. Mark. Hmm. Uh, things that a lot of people didn't, get well i'm not gonna win with this answer but i'm gonna go with what first came to me and this will sound a a, a little odd but bear with me and it's actually the movie the graduate and how that movie at its essence when you're watching it is all about rejecting um casual sex about rejecting kind of the the empty ambitions that it was lampooning um in the late 60s uh early 70s when it came out and the reason why i say this is because i we watched this movie as part of a class when i was in high school and when we got done with it and we started talking about it there were a few people my teacher included who, when we got done, she actually apologized and said, gee, I'm sorry, I didn't realize, I didn't remember how pro-promiscuity this movie was. And I I remember, you know, even being 15 years old, sitting in my chair thinking, how stupid do you have to be to think that this movie is in favor of promiscuity? And as I've gone on, I've seen that there are multiple people who have actually taken that kind of facile interpretation of it. Um, it really gone on just the surface of what happens in the movie and not digging into kind of the deeper meanings behind, you know, a lingering camera shot at the end as you watch, you know, Benjamin and realize the mistakes he's made. Um, so it, it, it's a movie for me that always stuck in my head as kind of a barometer for knowing if somebody can understand movies beyond a basic level so i know it's gonna lose the the answer and i'm gonna have to come up with seven questions for next week because that's what always happens and you favor maya anyway so but that's what i'm going with the graduate 
I, I like the 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 needy whining at the end. That's pretty good. Yeah. So the, the answer for me is uh, the the ending of Million Dollar Baby, which I don't know. Maya, have you seen that movie? I have not. Mark, have you seen that movie? Yes, I have. Spoiler alerts for that movie. I'm shocked at how many people don't realize that Clint Eastwood killed himself at the end of that movie. Um, no. You know, he he takes he takes two of the the shots with him, and he he gives one to Hillary Swank. And then the last shot of him is him eating a piece of pie. And the thing he said about that pie earlier in the movie is that this is this is what I want to eat. This is the last thing I want to eat before I die because it's so good. Uh, so the heavy implication to me in that movie is, is that he was taking that second shot for himself because the consequences of what he had to do to Hillary Swank in order to appease what she wanted as her, uh, you know, her life degraded, you know, it was a really powerful ending to me. And then I went and you know, listen to people talk about the movie on the radio because it's controversial because it has euthanasia in it and whatnot. Um, and, and to see how many people missed the point that it was such a devastating thing for him to do that the, the only consequence for him to do after that was to kill himself um, showed how they weren't taking that topic lightly. And it was, I, I, it blew me away that it seemed like people didn't understand that that's what he was doing at the end of the movie. So I, I, always still annoys me, even though, I mean, I, I think a, a lot of that movie, even though I haven't seen it in a while, but, uh, when anyone talks about it, I almost immediately want to needle them to be like, what did you think of the ending? Tell me about the ending. Just so I can hear if, if they are on the same wavelength with me. Um, I am going to give the point and the victory, not because of his whining, but because I like his answer better to Mark. I'm amazed how many people watch the graduate and don't understand what's happening in that last shot at all. Let alone, you, you know, you talked about some deeper things um, as, as far as promiscuity or whatever, but how many people don't realize that it's just not a happy ending that they don't want to be together after they, they run yeah. away together. There's so many people that miss that saying, and I also like the ending of the Sopranos. My bigger interpretation of the ending of The Sopranos isn't necessarily as much they didn't know how to end it. It was that they were saying that Tony doesn't know what's happening in his life. He doesn't know if it's Meadow walking through that door or a guy with a shotgun. And we're never going to know. And he's going to live the rest of his life wondering what's going to happen there. So I think they're both good endings. But I'm going to give the point to Mark because I think less people get that one. Um, so Mark, congratulations. Woo! You win oh, this so round. Nice. I think this is Mark's second ever victory. So, you know, that's like, right. And I would like to point out that one of those points was me picking daredevil and you not. I'd like to point that this is a uh, protest because you don't know your comic history. Oh, okay. Again, wasn't asking you for the writer was asking you for the character. So <laughs> as we, uh, we go now, we're going to, we're going to give Mark his 20 seconds of glory. 